Hi, welcome to Cloverdale Farm County Park. My name is Patty Trasferini. I'm the program coordinator here. You're here on a virtual tour of the park itself and the visitor center. I kind of wanted to start with some of the history of the farm to begin with. So starting with the history, Benjamin Oliphant of Stafford Township came to own the property around 1860. He sold the land in 1871 to William Cox. He is the individual that surveyed the land, set out the cranberry vines, and hence how Cranber Cloverdale Farm County Park came into existence. Cloverdale, over the years, has changed ownership. When William Cox sold his property, he sold it to Sarah and Wilina Holman. They were married to Charles Holman, who was married to Sarah, and their son, James Holman, was married to Wilmina. They had a big cranberry firm in Jackson, New Jersey, called C.L. and J.D. Holmans. The interesting fact about the Holmans I just read up on is in 1901, they were so lucrative in their trade and business, they sold 300 barrels of cranberries down to Fort Worth, Texas. That's a lot of cranberries and that's quite a distance. And that's when the cranberry craze started to take hold in New Jersey. The Holman family hold on, held onto the property until roughly 1924. In 1924, they sold it to William Ira Couch. What's interesting about William Ira Couch from the family members, we have discovered that he was actually related to the Holmans. I think that's a really cool fact we didn't know about. And the other thing that's really neat is then truthfully, the farm has been in hand, family hands since 1894, pretty remarkable. The farm itself, underneath Ira Couch, stood in family hands because him and his wife Edith in 1955 decided to sell to William Bill Collins. When they sold the property, he actually commingled the property with his father, William Zeb Collins. When they mixed the property in 1960, the property came one complete piece. That included Joseph Collins' property, also known as Grandfather's Bog, we call it today, which is our natural land trust parcel a little further back in the woods, and Cloverdale Farm County Park. Now, Bill operated and worked the operations of the Cranberry Farm, and he also worked as a bus driver because he needed extra money. The thing that amazes me about Bill is one of his quotes. It was featured in the Asbury Park Press in a piece called, Not All Berries Are Bogged. And he actually reflects on his history. His history of the farm, as quote, goes back to 1927. He was one year old when he came to the bogs here at Cloverdale in 1928. He worked those bogs and seen the growth over the years. He started simply with his family's bogs and built up to an additional 18 acres of land. With his time here, Bill has built an affinity for cranberry industry, but more importantly, for the history of Barnegat. That's why after his last harvest in 1999, his wife, Kathy, had to make a decision in his passing of 2000 as what to do with the property. She knew Bill wouldn't be happy with the realty corporations taking hold of the land and seeing development. Bill would want it preserved. With the backing of a few Barnegat Township committee members and advocates in the community, they spoke to Freeholder Bartlett. When they got Freeholder Bartlett on the grounds, he fell in love with the property as much as we have. In 2004, we were able to acquire the land as Ocean County Green Acres Funds and Ocean County Natural Land Trust property to be preserved today for a beautiful park to take a hike in. The cranberry grows on a six foot long vine. On that vine, there is actually uprights, which will eventually produce the flower, and once pollinated, becomes the cranberry. The interesting thing about a cranberry, if you were to pick one off the vine and cut it in half, what you would see is that it has a thick leathery skin. What you also will see is the seed chambers that are filled with air with normally five to six little tiny seeds on the inside. Those seed chambers give the cranberry the ability to float. So when found naturally along a stream bed, they would be able to transplant themselves using the water as a vessel downstream and lodge into a bank and slowly as the skin of the berry kind of softens or rots away, it would be able to plant itself and grow a whole new cranberry vine. 
The cranberry vine, as I mentioned, has that six foot runner, very similar to a strawberry. As I mentioned earlier, the uprights are what produces the fruit. What's amazing about the cranberry is its feet just need a little bit of organic matter and sand. Sand is actually the most natural thing to promote, stimulate growth for the cranberry vine itself. The cranberry has different seasons like any kind of crop. Typically, if you were to visit Cloverdale Farm County Park in November, you're gonna see our bogs are actually flooded over. The reason we flood up the bogs are over is to protect them from the winter frost. The bud is already set for next year. So by flooding them over, we keep that bud safe. However, in winter time, oftentimes the growers will actually sand their bog, as you see in this demonstration of the dump truck on the bog. The thing that's interesting with more milder winters we're getting, cranberry growers are having a harder time sanding the bog. So they have, in New Jersey, adapted a process of actually sanding their bogs using a barge or a small boat. So what happens is they would put two to three inches of sand on the bog, and as the bog pretty much, the ice melts, the sand will coat evenly the vines. And again, that stimulates growth. In the spring, Come April, we flood down the bogs. The bogs, which were dormant underneath the water, are red in color. In about two weeks, you'll start to see the vines turn a nice, vibrant green color. After the vines are green, they'll start to regrow and they'll spring up those uprights we talked about earlier. With the uprights, they'll begin to flower late May and June. Those flowers eventually get pollinated by bees. It depends on what the grower does, but most growers will bring in one hive for approximately a half acre of land for the bees to help pollinate to ensure they have a steady crop. In summertime, the berries actually form. What's amazing about the cranberries, and most people don't know this, when you drink white cranberry juice, you're actually eating a unripened cranberry. That's when they're in the green state, which is roughly around August. White cranberry juice has just added sugar to it. And it was actually an ocean spray marketing when they added more sugar because they had an overproduction of crop that season. Most of the time, by the end of September, you can see this nice little blush color forming on the berry itself. And then normally, by late September, into early October, the berries will be ready to pick. As I was mentioned, the autumn harvest typically takes place in September through October. At Cloverdale Farm County Park, we're a dry harvest, so we're a little dif different than the pictures shown here. In the pictures shown, this is actually a wet harvest, which most people are familiar with. During the wet harvest, they basically flood the bogs and they allow the cranberry vines to float to the surface and they corral them up up a conveyor belt and into a truck to send them in for processing. So the American cranberry has an interesting namesake. Its name actually derived from the crane. As you can see in this picture, the crane looks very similar to the flower. If you look at the beak, it looks like the stamen of the flower and the folds of the petal look like the head and neck of the crane. It is believed that earlier settlers called it a crane berry with the E. Later, when the English came to settle the area, the E was removed and the modern day cranberry, as we know it, came into existence. In James Rosner's book, Land of Virginia, he first documents the Native Americans actually standing on shores with bark cups of cranberries greeting the ships as they came ashore. It was a symbol of peace by the Lenape tribes and Algonquin tribes. What's really interesting is that the wild cranberry was easily harvested. It was picked up during the September and October when the berries were ready to cultivate and made into dyes, used in municipal purposes, and as well as being made into pemmican. Pemmican is the equivalent of a modern day protein bar. Essentially, it's ground up berries mixed with some dry meat and fish and some added fat for protein. So cranberries became so popular by the seafarers Typically, we know sailors as limeys, in particular because they ate limes. What's really amazing is those limes, by the time you left Florida and came up our coast, were actually rotten. So they needed another source of vitamin C. Well, lo and behold, the cranberry. So you could buy a 100-pound barrel 
and actually be able to take your transatlantic voyage across the sea back to Europe and have no problems with scurvy. The other thing that was happening about that time, since the cranberries were so prized by seafarers, that basically in 1789, they had to make an act to preserve the cranberries native in New Jersey. It was an act that basically said, if you weren't the property owner, or you were found on state land and between June 1st and October 10th, picking somebody's berries or stealing their vines, you would have to pay 20 shillings as an offense fee. So mostly cranberries were hand-picked until roughly the late 1890s where scoops were invented. The way a scoop typically worked is you could hold the handle of a scoop and go down low over the vines and you would catch the berries. So again, you would go down really low, scoop up, and the berries would drop into the box-like structure. There were different types of scoops. As you can see, this model, which is from Kelly's Bog, with the big K and the number, was a way they would actually monitor who was using their scoops, because they were a commodity at that time. They are very expensive to make and to maintain. There was also scoops like this one that you see up top. There's different scoops. And most of the scoops were used in very much the same way. In 1920, as a way to kind of make the harvest process go faster, a mechanical dry picker was actually invented. The first dry picker was known as the Matheson picker that was invented. The Matheson picker at that time marketed for $2,800. Pretty fair high market price. When you compare it to a Model T, that was roughly $250. So a lot of the growers weren't really interested in spending that much money. However, this requires two people. The two-person team would be the driver who would walk behind the machine, which is self-propelled, and a person to run the bags or the box off the back of the picker. The way this picker worked, as I mentioned, self-propelled, so it walked forward. And basically, the tines on the picker were rotating combs. They would sweep up, grab the cranberries, drop them into a conveyor belt on the back, which would convey them up into the bag and box that you currently see. A recent donation that we received is actually this cranberry scoop. When I saw it, I realized it's not like a typical New Jersey scoop that I just showed you with the single handle. It's a double scoop style handle. When I did some research, we found very interesting. This scoop was actually a transition piece. The harvest I showed you is meant to go into a bog that's dry. This scoop instead would go into a slightly flooded cranberry bog. The scoop was built to be in the hands like so, and the person operating the scoop would walk behind and scoop the berries that would be floating on the surface of the water. But it wasn't the wet method that everybody's familiar with today in the ocean spray commercials. The wet harvest method, which most people are familiar with, actually was invented, believe it or not, in 1960, which to me took forever to invent. The harvest is slightly different. It requires riding on a agitator, as they call it, which is basically a water wheel, which would rake over the vines when they're flooded and shake the vines, producing the cranberry, as we mentioned earlier, giving it the ability to float. When those cranberries floated, they would go up to the surface and be corralled into a small area with a boom, then go up the conveyor belt into a truck. Interestingly, the dry harvest berries we just talked about in dry harvest, those were sold in the produce section as fresh fruit, where the wet harvest typically were made into canned sauces and juices. Welcome to Cloverdale's Packing House. This is the fun part. So Cloverdale Farm County Park has a packing house which we believe dated back to the Holman era. When Ira Couch came on the scene, he had bunk houses here so that at night they could watch for the frost. Over time, the packing house was modified to be actually a place where the cranberries were brought in for sorting, separating, and processing before it was actually brought down to either Penn Producing, which is on, used to be on West Bay Avenue in Barnegat, where the Mosquito Commission is today, or actually out by the railroad at Barnegat Railroad Station. The history of the cranberry sorter, which you see next to me, has a really remarkable kind of past. It's thanks to a name by John Pegleg Webb, who lived in Cassville, 
which is also known as Jackson Township, New Jersey. While John Pegleg Webb was storing some cranberries, he climbed up a set of rafters. When he climbed up the ladder, he slipped and his leg let go. And what he noticed is as the box tipped, the berries, which are sound, known as healthy, bounced down the rungs of the ladder. The berries that were unsound splat and stood still. From that point in time, the first cranberry separator in our nation was invented. It was invented by a then resident of Cassville, but also New Brunswick, D.T. Stanford. D.T. Stanford took John Pegleg's principle of the bounce technique to build this machine that you see here today, or truthfully, a machine similar to it, as this is a Bailey separator. Once the cranberries are picked for the field, they were normally picked in long boxes and brought into the packing house. In the packing house, there would be a machine like this, which its initial job is to blow off the chaff. When I say chaff, I'm referring to leaves and other debris that might have got mixed in with the cranberries. The box is poured into the top of the machine, and basically there's a tumbler that blows the chaff off the berry before it transfers them to a conveyor belt that you'll see in a second. Okay. So the cranberries typically bought in from the field were be brought in with a larger box. However, for the ease of me and lifting, we went with a smaller box. The box would essentially be poured into the machine here, whose primary job was to actually take the chaff and seeds and other things out of the cranberries to make it easier for processing. The way it did it, there would be a blower that essentially would blow the cranberries and clean them, and that way they could be separated further. The conveyor basically brings the cranberries back upwards to the top. Once it reaches the top of the machine, the berries will drop down and then go through a series of bounces and rungs. At that point, the sound berries are separated from the unsound berries. So the cranberry machine itself inside has a series of steps. As we talked about John Pegleg's principle of bouncing, those cranberries are gonna bounce down those steps. As they do it, a couple processes take place. The berries that are unsound are gonna drop in the bottom of the machine into a bucket, which is a wooden box at the base. And those ones will actually be disposed of. The berries that are sound will continue down where they'll actually be going over a grater, which you see here. At that grate, the little tiny pie berries, or too small for market, would slip through the cracks and they could actually be sold and marketed a different method. Where the good sound berries, which you see on the conveyor belt right here, would continue down to the end into a box and then they would be packed up and shipped to market. <laughs> days of hand picking, oftentimes immigrant families would come in from Philadelphia, and I truly mean families. They would have infants all the way up to teenagers with them. The teenagers would be lugging the big boxes off the bogs, which are known as long boxes. The young children, as young as four and five years old, had a job. Their job was to run the peck box. A peck box holds about eight quarts of cranberries. When that peck box was filled, you needed fast feet to run this box off the bog for the family to get a little ticket. The amount of peck boxes would actually equal out their payment at the end of the year. Their payments were based on how many tickets they had. So the faster the movement from bog hand-picked off the bog to where a payone or boss man would be standing to get the chip or ticket, 
the faster and more money that family would make. Again, the peck box, eight quarts. When you actually take the pecks box and you fill a bushel box four times, thus, it would be 32 quarts was a bushel basket. The bushel and the long box was the only difference of about two quarts. The long box held six quarts, so therefore 48 quarts of cranberries. So one story I want to tell you will help illustrate basically what was going on in the cranberry industry around 1890-1900. The problem that was going on is there was no representative for a standard sale or price of the cranberry. So oftentimes cranberry farmers, no matter where they live, whether Wisconsin, New Jersey, Massachusetts, had to go through a fruit or vegetable dealer and distributor or also a commission merchant. And sometimes they got the short end of the stick. There's one story in particular I want to mention, and it's from the book Cranberry Hard Work and Holiday Sauce by Stephen Cole and Winnie Gifford. That article kind of outlines what was going on. So the storyline that goes, and it's a true tale, was a Massachusetts grower, thinking he was doing right, sold to a distributor that had a location in New York City. Well, the Massachusetts grower got a check, and that check was pretty small. He wasn't too happy with it, so he didn't cash it. But his brain started to go, and he had an idea. That idea was very simply to go instead to New York City. And he disguised himself as a local merchant looking to buy produce for his market. So he inquired with that person who we never met face to face for some potatoes, some onions, and those gorgeous cranberries that he saw. And well, those cranberries were pretty expensive and the dealer was pretty hard stuck on his price. He refused to budge. And finally he said, take it or leave it. Well, the cranberry grower was pretty smart. He said, I'll do you a favor, I'll take them all. And out of his pocket, as he acted to get his money, he pulled a letter that told him how much the cranberries were going for, as well as that check. Well, let's just say that dealer that was supposedly willing to help the grower, his face was red as a cranberry. In 1900, the Wisconsin growers were going the same thing that Massachusetts and New Jersey growers were going through. Unscrupulous people willing to sell their cranberries for a profit, but not give the growers the money they deserve. So in 1906, a group of growers hired Arthur Cheney. His sole job was trying to find a way to sell cranberries and make them more marketable. The first way he did that in 1906 was to get a barrel, 100 pound barrel was how they were sold at the time. Similar to like a big sugar or wine barrel that we're all familiar with today. In 1911, the National Cranberries Association merged with the Grower Cranberry Association and therefore formed the American Cranberry Exchange. The American Cranberry Exchange underneath Arthur Cheney had an interesting transformation in 1916. Basically, Cheney went to Advertisement Corporation and said, I need some help. And when they asked, what do you want? He said simply, I want more people to eat cranberries. Hence, the Eat More label came into existence. The Eat More cranberry labels you see here are more than just beautiful artwork. They actually signify the species or type of cranberry, the size, the color, and the overall quality of cranberry. The thing that's really interesting is each grower often had a different type of label. This one, which is our, the Arbutus label, was done, used by the Larrabee family, which was in Lakehurst as well as in Manchester Township at Larrabee Boggs. Their berry was the Jersey berry, which was a medium color, medium size berry. As you can see, all the New Jersey labels are yellow in color. However, the Eatmar labels made out of Wisconsin were red, and they're different. The round is for a 100 pound barrel, or they would be quarter boxes, would often use the square rectangular labels. 
where Massachusetts would actually have the same, but they would be blue in color, which is kind of neat. This one is the Pilgrim brand. And also what you could see is the rectangular Mayflower. Thank you for taking the virtual tour today of Cloverdale Farm County Park. If you're interested in coming to the park itself, we're open every day, dawn to dusk. Visitor Center is open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 10 to 4 o'clock. You could take a closer look at some of the displays and learn anything and everything you want about the cranberry. We're glad we take our time with you. We hope you have a great day. Enjoy.